This is John Daly in Paris. I'm standing outside the sentry booth in the square in front of the Bastille on this sweltering hot day of July 14, 1789. More than 50,000 citizens have been kept waiting here since 10 a.m. Paris time, 5 a.m. New York time, by the Marquis de Launay, governor of the Royal French Prison Fortress. The crowd is demanding that the governor surrender the Bastille so that the people may have the arms inside to defend themselves against the king's mercenary troops who are at this very moment surrounding the city. If Delaunay refuses to turn the fortress and its arms over to the citizens of Paris, July 14, 1789, CBS is there. The citizens of Paris before the Bastille. Columbia asks you to imagine that our microphone is at this famous event. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. CBS is there. This broadcast, the second in a special summer series produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, Paris, July 14th, 1789, and John Daly. It's off the minute. The people of Paris are angry and restless. After years of indignities, hardships, and a struggle for a voice in their own government, King Louis XVI called the National Assembly at Versailles to write a new constitution. The hopes of the people for recognition of their rights were raised high, only to be rudely shattered a few days ago when the king suddenly, without warning, threw 30,000 troops around Paris, mostly foreign mercenaries, and threatened to suspend the National Assembly by force. The people are boiling with anger at this betrayal of their hopes, and they are also desperately afraid that the king's troops may invade the city or at the very least attempt to force them into submission by starvation. In a frantic hurry to gather arms with which to defend themselves, they have assembled here before the Bastille, the only remaining royal garrison in the city. Four times they have sent delegations inside to demand its peaceful surrender of the governor. Three times they have returned not only empty-handed, but also with a warning to disperse. Now, the fourth and what may be the final delegation has been inside the Bastille for over an hour. If the governor still refuses, there's no telling what may happen. The people don't want bloodshed, but they're grimly determined to have arms and the Bastille, which to them is a symbol of tyranny. And they're carrying every conceivable kind of weapon right now that they've been able to lay their hands on. I can see pikes and sticks and hatchets. Others are carrying axes and old swords, and a few even have muskets, which they seized this morning from the Hotel des Invalides. There are also several cannons, but... Whether they can take the Bastille is another matter. I've asked a young Parisian lawyer to tell you what he thinks about that. His name is Jacques Danton. He's standing by the sentry booth with me at the foot of the outer drawbridge. The booth, by the way, is empty. The guard was taken away by the people earlier, enabling us to set up our CBS equipment here. Monsieur Danton. Here we the Bastille is surrounded by two moats. It has a ten-foot stone wall, a garrison of Swiss mercenaries and old French soldiers, and it literally bristles with cannon in the towers. Now, if the governor refuses to surrender, it would seem almost impossible for the people to take it. The walls of the Bastille, monsieur, are no stronger than where the walls of Jericho. Now, that red and blue cockade you're wearing, uh, Monsieur Danton, I see that almost everybody here is wearing one. Does it have any special significance? It is the colors of Paris, but we call it the cockade of liberty. Now, tell me, sir, haven't I seen you at the Palais Royal with Messieurs Desmoulins, Robespierre, and Marat? That is possible, monsieur. We are friends. Well, aren't you uh, more than that? Aren't you all leaders of the radical group here in Paris? Uh, some people say so. Right. Well, where are your friends today? Are they with you? Are they down here? Yes, they are out in the crowd somewhere. And that crowd, sir, seems restive. It seems to have a bad temper. Temper? We are sick of financial ruin caused by war, corruption, and extravagance. Falling on those least able to bear it. We are no longer willing to carry the load our fathers endured. We look to political changes that will make all men free and equal. Brothers of one great human family. Well, some of your countrymen, Monsieur Danton, have told me that our own American Revolution has had some influence on the spirit of the French people during the past six months. Um, Monsieur Daly, we admire your young country very much. It has given the people of Paris hope for better things. Not beyond the grave, but here on earth, now, today. Thank you, sir. Monsieur Danton is walking away now, losing himself in the crowd. A huge, brawny figure of a man, black-browed with a powerful face, the heavy shock of black hair, which he keeps brushing away from his eye. There's still no sign of the delegation's return from the Bastille. We thought they were ready to come out when we went on the air, but there seems to be more delay. 
We're still waiting here at the sentry booth, and we hope you'll stay with us. Meanwhile, my colleague, Ken Roberts, is out there in the crowd somewhere with a portable transmitter. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to him. Go ahead, Ken. Come in, Ken Roberts. This is Ken Roberts. I'm standing approximately dead center of the Place de la Bastille, right in the very heart of this massive mob of people. It's hot here. The heat here is terrific. The temperature must be at least 110. Regardless of what happens here this afternoon, July 14th will probably be remembered by the people of Paris as the hottest day of the year. The crowd here around me stretches way back up the Rue Saint-Antoine as far as the eye can see, into the very heart of Paris. There are all kinds of people here, shopkeepers, middle-class citizens, and many of the city's 200,000 beggars. There are even some women and children. Most of them are poorly dressed and undernourished, reflecting the conditions under which they've been living for so long in these narrow, crooked, and dirty streets of Paris. They're standing and moving about in small groups. Some are hanging out of the windows bordering the square. I've been, I've been looking around here trying to find some people who can speak English, but I haven't had much luck except for one man. We'll get to him in just a moment. But first, first here's a typical young Parisian housewife, and I'm going to... Madame Dupré, monsieur. Oui, madame, madame, s'il vous plaît. She is slender, dark complexion, hair disheveled, wearing a faded gingham dress. I'm going to ask her what she intends to do with that axe in her hand. Madame Dupré, qu'allez-vous faire avec cette hache? Détruire la Bastille, monsieur. Tout le monde a la de la Bastille. Nous en avons assez. Appelle la famille. Ah, smash the Bastille, she says. Everybody's smashing the Bastille. We're tired of darling. We've had enough. Madame Dupré wants to wipe out the aristocrats who burn down the palace at Versailles. And she looks as if she means it, gripping that axe in one hand and her little boy in the other. Here's her little boy now. Uh, come on, Tabar Du Petit. Oh, Philippe. Philippe. And uh, quel âge as-tu, Philippe? Philippe says he's eight years old. Philippe, qu'est-ce que tu fais ici aujourd'hui? Je vais prendre la Bastille. Vive la liberté! Philippe says he's going to take the Bastille. And now, now for the man I told you about before, the one who speaks English. His name is Monsieur Latude. Monsieur Latude. It's rather unusual for anyone in Paris today to speak English. Have you lived in England? Is that where you learned it? No, Monsieur. I learn English in the Bastille. In the Bastille? Oui, I was a prisoner there for 35 years. 35 years in prison? You are astonished, monsieur. Well, yes, you didn't tell me, monsieur Latude. I had no idea. May I ask, how did it happen? Why were you in there? I uh, was charged with insulting Madame de Pompadour. She was the favorite of King Louis XV. Well, did you insult her? No, it was not true, but... Uh, what can one do against the king's letter of the cachet? Yes. Letter of the cachet? Isn't, isn't that the paper the king signs committing a person to the Bastille without trial, evidence, or judge? Oui, monsieur, that is the letter of the cachet. The king signs it in blank and he leaves the name of the victim to be filled in. And then he gives these blanks to his friends to use as they see fit, is that it? That is it, monsieur. You put yourself in that place. If anyone tries to make love to your wife or annoys you by loud talk at a dinner party... All you have to do is just write in the offensive person's name, hand it to the authorities, and voila, that is the last you hear of him. Well, is that all you did, Monsieur Latour? Is that why you spent 35 years in the Bastille for nothing? For nothing, Monsieur. Well, Monsieur Latour, what is it like inside the Bastille? How do they treat you in there? Uh, that is a long story, Monsieur. But I will tell you one thing. Once they put me into a dungeon, the cell was covered with a foot of water. I was chained to the wall, and they kept me there for 40 months. Eh oui, the Bastille is a foreign It should be destroyed. A ball, a Bastille! I understand how you feel, Monsieur Latude. And now tell me, please, who was it who taught you English in the Bastille? It was another prisoner, Major the White from Ireland. He is still in there. You see, I escaped. You escaped? Well, tell us about it, Monsieur Latuda. I never heard of anybody escaping from the Bastille. Well, Monsieur, I... I, I, I just a moment. Excuse me, please, Monsieur Latuda. I can see a signal from the battlement. A man is up there waving to the crowd. Something is evidently going on. Perhaps the delegation is coming down. I'm too far away, so I'm going to switch you back to John Daly at the outer drawbridge. This is John Daly. The signal from the tower is coming from Monsieur Rosier, the leader of the people's delegation. He's waving his hat. He's holding up his hand for attention. The crowd is quieting down a bit now. Apparently, he's about to say something. I'd like you to hear it if it's possible, so I'm going to lift our CBS microphone high in the air. He says the delegation will be out immediately. This is it. 
The delegation will be out immediately. The crowd is very... Looks like the governor has finally come to terms. The people will have the Bastille and the arms to defend themselves against surrounding Paris. Monsieur Rosier has disappeared from the tower. The people's delegation is on the way down now, and I'll have the details of this surrender for you in just a few minutes. A feeling of enormous relief seems to have swept the square. I don't think anyone here, really, in his heart, thought he could take this fortress by storm. And if you were here with me, you could see what I mean. The eight circular towers of the Bastille, each 70 feet high, bristle with cannon. The entrance is defended by two yawning moats, 25 feet wide and 25 feet deep. And even if the people could drag down the drawbridges and hurdle these moats, they would run into the murderous fire of the guns manned by the French and the Swiss garrison. But there's no chance of anything like that happening now. This powerful fortress, which has played host to nearly every famous man in France at one time or another, played host to the man of the Iron Mask, to Marshal Richelieu, to Cardinal de Rohan, to Voltaire, Rousseau, Montesquieu, is about to fall into the hands of the French people for the first time since it was built in the 13th century. By the way, you can probably hear the chains rattling as the inner drawbridge comes down. And remember, even Peter the Great, the czar of all the Russians, was refused entrance into this tower of human misery and inhuman woe. No one knows how many prisoners are in there now, but if you'll stay with us for a while, we'll soon find out. For their day of liberation is here. The inner drawbridge is down now. There are the delegates. They are coming over the bridge. Five men in black hats and long black frock coats with Monsieur Rosier in the lead. They're walking across the inner court and the outer drawbridge is coming down. But the first one is being taken up again. I don't quite get the meaning of that. For if the Bastille is to be surrendered, both drawbridges should be down. But we'll find out about that in just a moment. The outer drawbridge is down, and the delegates are walking rapidly across the bridge. They seem to be in a great hurry, and this crowd is pushing me around here. They're pushing me forward onto the drawbridge. Monsieur Rosier! Monsieur Rosier, into the microphone, please. Something has happened. Something is wrong. Rosier has just shouted that the governor has not surrendered the Bastille. I'll repeat that. The governor has not surrendered the Bastille. Monsieur Rosier is right on the edge of the bridge with me. Now some of the people understand they're pushing back towards the Place de la Bastille. But the ones behind them who haven't heard are still pushing forward. Attention, Cab, s'il vous plaît, attention. There's a lot of confusion here, and I'm caught in the mob. On arrière, on arrière. La Bastille, n'est pas encore en dos. Oh, it's no use. I just can't hold them. They pushed Rosier and the delegates aside, and we're being forced across the bridge with the mob into the courtyard. I'm in the courtroom, courtyard now, rather, and I hope the microphone cable has swung out over the drawbridge into the moat. I don't know whether I'm still on the air, but assuming that I am, the people are still coming over. There are about 200 with me, and they're screaming and yelling. The guards are raising the outer drawbridge. People are spilling off into the moat or jumping forward into the inner court. Both the drawbridges are up. And we're jammed into the island courtyard between the two moats. Now, this is what has happened. This crowd of about 200 men and women who pushed across the outer drawbridge have been cut off here from the main mob across the moat in the Place de la Bastille. There is water on both sides of us. We're cut off. Gee, hot the The governor has turned the guns of the Bastille and the people here in the court. They're helpless. So am I. If these bridge members don't stop those bullets, he's shooting them down like cattle. Men, women, falling, screaming. This is horrible. The mob in the square outside can't do a thing. They can't get to us. They've opened fire on the Bastille, though, but their fire is useless. The bullets are smacking into these bridge timbers like so much hail. We're trapped here between the two drawbridges, but at least a couple of our men are up hacking away at the chains of the outer bridge. The people are being massacred, cut down. They're all on the ground, turning and twisting in agony. They're killing them, all of them, every one of them. There's hardly a person standing up. This is unbelievable. I can't believe it. It's ruthless, inhuman. Our only hope now is to get the outer drawbridge down and get some help from outside. Two of our men have gotten up on that drawbridge, as I told you, and they're hacking away at those chains. You can hear it probably. They cut it through. There it goes. The outer drawbridge is down. The outer bridge is down. 
down. And the mob from the square is coming across to help us. They're pouring in by the hundreds, by the thousands. The best deal is stormed. The people are storming the best deal. The people are firing up at the parapet, trying to pick off those Swiss guards. The bullets are flying all around us. Oh, that was close. The Frenchmen are shooting at the best deal from across the square and up on the rooftops. The garrison, the guards, are answering with volley after volley of fire from the fortress. I can see some wagons now loaded with hay, and the people are bringing them up here. They're going to set fire to the governor's house here on the island between the two drawbridges, and they're doing it. There are three cannons. Three cannons are being wheeled into place. The people must have taken them this morning from the Hotel des Avilas. They're training them on that inner drawbridge. They're going to blast it down. The governor's house is starting to burn. Smoke is coming up from it, and now our cannons are in position. They ought to go off at any minute. No, no, something's changed. The firing inside the Bastille seems to be slackening off a bit, but the people in, out here are still firing. They're mad with rage at the sight of the bodies of their own people who were shot down by the governor. Now the firing from inside seems to have stopped. The governor's house is burning, though, a flaming inferno. Smoke is shooting up in great billows. Oh, someone in the parapets is waving a white flag. He's shouting something. I, I can't hear what he's saying. There's too much racket. But the drawbridge, the inner drawbridge is coming down. The bridge is down. The best deal is really surrendering this time. The gates are being opened. The people have stopped firing, and they're going wild. They're screaming over the bridge into the fortress. I can't follow them, but Ken Roberts is coming up with his portable transmitter. Go inside. Inside, Ken. Stay with the mob. I'll switch to you when you get well inside. Well, now the unbelievable has happened. The people have done the impossible. They have captured the Bastille. But I still can't understand why the governor fired in the first place. It was either accidental, that is, a misunderstanding of orders, or it may have been deliberate treachery. I also can't understand the suddenness of this surrender. It was completely unexpected. And there must have been some strong reason for the governor to surrender so quickly after his massacre of these people out here. Perhaps there was a mutiny inside by French troops. Or else maybe the governor could have been shot. Or perhaps it was the threat of the three cannon out here which persuaded him to give up in the hope of generous terms. Well, at any rate, the Bastille has surrendered and Ken Roberts should be well inside by now and ready to tell you what's going on in there. Go ahead, Roberts. This is Ken Roberts. I'm inside the Bastille in a huge inner courtroom, quite high, I'd say about 20 feet and 40 by 40 in length and width. There are no lights, no windows, a stone floor and wall. Pine torches stuck into the walls cast an eerie light over the wild confusion going on in here. The people are still pouring in. Some have seized the keys and already gone down into the dungeons to release the prisoners. The mob in here is shouting threats at the terrified garrison. The soldiers are lined up on two sides. Old French soldiers on the right, Swiss mercenaries on the left. They're all trembling with fear. They're shouting at the top of their lungs, Le Bastille Serrant, Le Bastille Serrant. The Bastille surrenders. The governor is in the middle of the room. Surrounded by the mob. He's wearing a gray frock coat, a red cross of Saint Louis, no hat. Somebody's just snatched his gold headed sword came from him. But the governor is taking it all. He's standing there, grim and defiant. He's got a lot to pay for. The brutal massacre of those people out there in the courtyard. Now, now I've worked my way up to one of the old French pensioners, and I'm going to ask him why the Bastille surrendered. Monsieur, pourquoi la Bastille est cette rendue? Nous l'avons forcé. Nous l'avons pas tiré sur nos frères. C'était les mercenaires suisses qui ont tiré. He says it was the Swiss guards who fired. The French soldiers refused to fire on their own people. They forced the governor to surrender. Le gouverneur, le gouverneur voulait décharger son pistolet dans ton autre poudre. Il voulait faire sauter la Bastille. Nous l'avons empêché. He says the governor wanted to blow up the Bastille, but they stopped him. And now, now the mob has seized the governor and the soldiers. They're dragging them out of the Bastille. Monsieur Rosier! Monsieur Rosier! Est-ce que vous les amenez? They're going to take the governor and his soldiers to the Hotel de Ville to be tried before a people's court. Just a moment, there's a prisoner. The first one, he must be a prisoner. He's old, very old. His hair is down to his feet, and it's white, completely white. I can see where the chains have been cut from his ankles. He's dragging a chain with him. He's blinking. He's holding his hand above his eyes. I guess he's not used to the torchlight. I'm going to speak to him. But no, monsieur. But no. Monsieur est arrivé. Quel âge avez-vous, monsieur? Uh, J'ai 90 ans. Oh, 90. He is 90. How long in prison, monsieur? Combien de temps avez-vous passé à la Bastille? 30 years in prison. Je vous félicite, 
monsieur, de votre révération de la Bastille. Oh, merci, monsieur. Et dire que Louis Caz et Madame de Pompadour diront des deux chats. I congratulate him, monsieur Tavernier, on his release. And he says he wonders what King Louis XV and Madame Pompadour will say. Both have been dead for at least 15 years. Now I'm going to ask him how many prisoners there are on the battlefield today beside himself. Monsieur, Monsieur, huh? combien de prisonniers y a-t-il? Uh, uh, Jean, uh, Bouchard, uh, Bernard, oui? uh, Laroche, uh, Antoine uh, Pujata, uh, uh, De White, uh, mm -hmm. Le Comte uh, de Solage, uh, La uh, Corée. Oui, oui. oui. <laughs> combien d'autres? C'est tout, c'est tout. <laughs> This is incredible. Monsieur Tavernier named six men. Counting himself, that makes only seven prisoners in the Bastille at the time of its fall. This is John Daly again at the sentry booth by the outer drawbridge. I've taken the air away from Ken Roberts because I've just been informed by our CBS studios here in Paris that the news of the Bastille's fall has already reached the king and his troops in Versailles. And we'll switch out there in just a moment. First, a last look at this turbulent scene. Part of the mob is dragging the governor and his garrison up the Rue Saint Antoine to the city hall, the Hotel de Ville. The people here are rolling barrels of gunpowder and cannon across the bridges. They're passing out guns, thousands of them taken from the Bastille arsenal. They're working feverishly against time because they're desperately afraid of the king's reaction. But now, for an on-the-spot account of that reaction, I switch you to Versailles, Harry Marble reporting. This is Harry Marble in Versailles. King Louis XVI has just ordered his troops withdrawn from around Paris. The order was issued just a few minutes ago, after His Majesty was informed of the surrender of the Bastille. The king was in the palace when the Duc de Liancourt, a member of the royal household, brought him the news. When de Liancourt told the king that the Bastille had been stormed, His Majesty inquired, Is this a revolt? And the Duke replied, No, sire, it is a revolution. The king then, without his usual bodyguard, without even his hat, but accompanied by his two brothers, ran out of the palace to the National Assembly on the edge of the palace grounds. There he made an unprecedented appeal to the National Assembly. He placed himself in the hands of the people's representatives, men he had only yesterday threatened to destroy. He urged them to help him ensure what he termed the salvation of the state. The king said, I await this from the National Assembly, from the zeal of the representatives of my people. The king also announced that he would go to Paris tomorrow and personally conciliate the people. He has also appointed the Marquis de Lafayette, head of the new National Guard, and the Marquis will escort him into Paris tomorrow. Lafayette, who helped us, the American people, win our independence a short time ago, has been playing a major role during the last eight years in France, helping his own people win a voice in their government. Today, he is vice president of the National Assembly. It's a particularly happy day for him. He's standing right here beside me. Monsieur de Lafayette, what does this mean today for the people of France? It means, monsieur that the spirit of the rights of man, which was born in France and nurtured by your country, has now returned to Europe. The king's decision to permit the National Assembly to continue with our work of writing a new constitution is the first concession he has ever made to the people. Whatever happens from now on, France, like America, has set its course on the road to democracy. There can be no turning back. Thank you, Marquis de Lafayette. And now, for the people's reaction to the King's announcement, we return you to Paris and John Daly. This is John Daly. I'm standing in the Place de Grave, the city square in front of the Hotel de Ville, the city hall. The unexpected news from Versailles has turned Paris into a frenzy of celebration. The people are dancing and parading in the streets, no longer in fear of their lives. They're shouting, long live liberty, long live France. The governor of the Bastille has been executed for the massacre of the 171 men and women murdered by his guns this afternoon. Several of the soldiers have also been executed, and one was thrown into the same. The heads of the governor and his soldiers have been placed on pikes and are now being carried around the city. This strikes a rather ghoulish note in the celebration here, perhaps, but if you knew the suffering of these people and what they have endured for the last 50 years at the hands of such despots as the Marquis de Launay, you perhaps would understand, if not condone, their actions. Tyranny always breeds violence, and to the people of Paris, the Bastille, with its drawbridges and dungeons, was a symbol of rotting tyranny. The excesses committed will perhaps soon pass, but the ideals behind them are certain to live on and to grow in the hearts of the French people here today and in the hearts of their children. Oh, here come the paraders once again, and they're singing. 
I recognize the tune. It's Ça Ira, an old French dance to which revolutionary words have been set. They're singing about hanging all aristocrats from lanterns. The streets of Paris, you know, are lighted by lanterns swung on ropes stretched across the roadway. But let's listen to the singer. women in the crowd is waving a large key, a very large key. One moment while I ask you what it is. Menzel! Menzel! Please, Jessica! La clé de la Bastille! Oh, she said it's the key of the Bastille. And she says she's going to give the key to Lafayette tomorrow when he arrives in Paris. Oui, Lafayette. Il général. Quel général? To Washington. Our General Washington and Lafayette's former commander. He's going to give the key of the Bastille to Lafayette so that Lafayette may present it to our own first president of the United States, his mightiness, George Washington. The crowd is still singing. I hope you can hear them. They're singing that song with the of the crowd. On this 14th day of July, 1789, the day that will undoubtedly go down in history as... Paris, July 14th, 1789. The Bastille is stormed, and the French Revolution begins. You have been listening to CBS Is There, the second in a special summer series of broadcasts of famous events. Next week, October 12, 1492, Columbus discovers America. CBS Is There. CBS Is There is produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Lewis Shayon, who wrote tonight's broadcast in collaboration with McAger Wren. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.